My name is Urban Alim. I'm the ambassador of Sweden. Warmly welcome to our commemoration of Ral Wallenberg. This event is organized by the Embassy of Sweden in collaboration with Ovid for Human Rights and the Ral Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Today, we celebrate the Ral Wallenberg Day on the 17th of January, which is the same day as he was taken away from Budapest. Canada has Ral Wallenberg as its first honorary citizen, which is a great pleasure for us at the Swedish Embassy, and we are very happy about that. And uh, it was 78 years today that he was taken away from Budapest. We are here to commemorate his deeds and talk about what we can do today to uh, make the world a better place, to remember people about the Holocaust and every time fighting anti-Semitism and racism. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Canadian government because the Canadian government has taken a decision to support a monument for Raoul Wallenberg here in Ottawa. You might see my little briefcase that I have on my suit. And that is a bronze briefcase that we usually use as a symbol of Raoul Wallenberg and his deeds. And the Canadian government has given money to erect a monument. We are still in the process of finding all the small details and finding all the money that is needed for this uh, project. But I just want to give you a small first look about how the monument will look like. It's a black stone granite with a big bronze briefcase on top that the National Capital Commission of Ottawa will uh, you know, decide a place where we can have this monument later on to commemorate Raoul Wallenberg. So today, I have the great pleasure to introduce to you our moderator, Linda Froome. The Honorable Linda Froome is a former member of the Senate of Canada and the former chair of the Senate's Conservative Caucus. She currently serves as chair of the board of directors for UJ, uh, the United Jewish Appeal, Federation of Greater Toronto. And she is also the chair of the Federation's New Countering Anti-Semitism and Hate Committee. In recognition of her civic contribution, Linda has received the Golda Meir Leadership Award from the State of Israel. Linda has also been awarded an honorary degree from Hebrew University for her leadership on the principles of equality, freedom, and human rights. It's an ex extreme pleasure for me to introduce to you and welcome the moderator, Linda Froome. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Ambassador. And it's so nice to see you again. And thank you so much. And thank you to the embassy for organizing this event uh, yet again. And I just want to tell you uh, how much I appreciate uh, your total commitment and dedication to honoring the memory of Raoul Wallenberg and honoring the memory of the Jews who, who were murdered in the Shoah. And it's very moving to me how important this is to you. And uh, I, have, I just have so much appreciation for you. Thank you, Linda. And unfortunately, we can never stop working on this topic. It's really important that we continue to highlight the Holocaust for the young generation and encourage them to really stop, uh, you know, uh, telling people when they are abusive and when they are using racism or they are discriminating other people and so on. So in every everyday life, we can listen to Ralph Wallenberg and do the best we can to uh, promote a better world. Indeed, indeed. And you are, you are a wonderful role model of this yourself. And I know that for us, uh, an important uh, um, event that's happened in the, in the years since we've last done this is that uh, the Ontario government has taken steps to introduce into the Ontario curriculum Holocaust education that will be mandatory for children in grade six. And I know that this is something that I'm sure Raul Wallenberg would very much have um, approved of. Uh, and uh, I know it's, it's very much going to be a focus of our of conversation that we're going to have today with, with our panelists to talk about the best ways, the best practices to teach Holocaust education to young people. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. let's start then, Linda. 
Okay, let's start. So um, our very, we have a number of really of excellent presentations. The first presentation we're gonna have today is going to come to us um, via video. And uh, we're going to have some speakers who are gonna focus on Raoul Wallenberg, discuss um, what his, his ongoing legacy can continue to teach all of us about the ways in which we can change people's lives every day. So our first three panelists will be Professor Erwin Kotler, Canada Special Envoy on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism, and the International Chair of the Ruhl Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. George Prager is a Shoah Budapest survivor and the founder and CEO of Ovid for Human Rights. And Cecilia Alberg is the great niece of Ruel Wallenberg and a member of the Raoul Wallenberg Academy. And they're gonna to come to us by video now. Hello, my name is Cecilia Alberg. I am the great niece of Raoul Wallenberg. Uh, Nina Lagergren, who founded the Raoul Wallenberg Academy in Sweden, uh, was my grandmother. And I am on the board for the Raoul Wallenberg Academy, and uh, I also do other chairs and uh, events and activities regarding Raoul and his life. I'm Erwin Kotler, international chair of the Canadian-based Raoul Wallenberg Center for for human rights, uh, involved in the case and cause of Raoul Wallenberg for over 40 years. Hello, my name is George Prager. I'm a Holocaust survivor uh, from Hungary, which I uh, survived at the age of eight. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Orbit for Human Rights, uh, which basically produces videos regarding Raoul and other aspects of the Shoah and other atrocities around the world. When Raoul got the question to go to Budapest, he did not hesitate. So he went down to the war. Um, in the middle of the wartime, he came to Budapest and he started working straight away. And uh, he writes home that they work day and night. And I think that is really important to be de devoted and dedicated to to what you think is important. And then he created something called Schützpass, and that was a an official document that wasn't really as a normal uh, passport, uh, but it protected these people. Uh, it was in Hungary, Hungarian and in German, so that everybody would understand it was with photos and then official stamps and whatnot. Uh, and through these Schützpasses, he saved a lot of people. And also he went down to the to the uh, to the river and saved people there and also also on the death marches. So he was very, very active. And he was only active for six months, but he's they say that he saved about ten thousand people, maybe even more, and that is a lot of people for that short period of time. And then he went with the Russians because he wanted to meet with them um as they were approaching and liberating uh, Hungary uh, to talk about how to give the Jews their properties back and how to rebuild uh, Budapest and Hungary. And he leaves with his Russian escort and he says to his colleagues, I don't know if I leave as a prisoner or as a guest. And that was the last time he was seen alive. And that was the 17th of January, 1945. The rest we don't really know. We know a few facts and a few things about his disappearance, um, but the whole truth we still do not know. And we've been fighting as a family for all these years. We still do, uh, together with researchers, which are very important in this matter because it's very hard to to fight these uh, and to try and find the truth all yourself. But then my grandmother used to go to schools to talk about Raoul because she thought that, you know, he, what he did is important and we can use him as a role model. So he, she went to schools and she talked about Raoul and it's a fascinating story and she was a wonderful person. So it was easy to listen to her. And then her other brother, Guy, he started researching. Uh, he was in Moscow trying to find out the truth about Raoul's fate. And 20 years ago, she started the Raoul Wallenberg Academy and we work to educate younger people, high school students, uh, in leadership and 
and in values, because I think that that is what also my grandmother thought was most important, that we lead people in a good ma matter, manner and with values that actually echo within you so that you feel like you're doing something really good. And when you find that balance, you can also use your civil courage to act every day, small things, little things, or big things. Uh, it's sometimes hard, and, and it's sometimes you, you have to uh, be a little bit um, strong, or, or it's hard with family if, if you have great-grandparents or whatever you have, or an uncle or somebody who says something, and you're like, we don't talk like that anymore. And that creates a little bit of, a, of an atmosphere at the dinner table. But uh, it's also important to discuss these things because we have to, to be able to change uh, the way we talk to people and uh, about people. And then we do have to talk about, talk about it. So in the Ralph Wallenberg Academy, we, um, we educate young people and we have the Ralph Wallenberg Prize and we also have now the Ralph Wallenberg Center in Sweden, and that is a digital um, walk about Rolls life. So that when we launch that together with you in Canada, we will we are happy to share that uh, story with you. On Ralph Wallenberg uh, commemorative day, uh, we remember and pay tribute to the Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg, whom the United Nations called the greatest humanitarian of the 20th century, Canada's first honorary citizen, who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, prevail, and transform history. From mid-May to the beginning of July 1944, some 400,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. The cruelest, quickest, most efficient killing field in all of the Holocaust, amidst the still international bystander community. Rao Wallenberg arrived at the Swedish legation in July 1944, and in a mixture of bluff and bravado, of inspiration and ingenuity, of mobilizing other uh, diplomats. They mobilized together under his leadership and saved over 50,000 Jews. So what the bystander international community did not do, one person confronted evil and showed how one person can make a difference. And so a central Malmo pledge by the Canadian government was not only teaching the Holocaust across generational lines, but within that, teaching about, learning about the heroic life and enduring legacy of Raoul Wallenberg, how each one of us can make a difference, how each one of us, young people, just by one act of kindness, by one good deed every day, can help transform the universe. That's a legacy that we should all not only learn about, but act upon. Well, I'm almost tearing up because there are so many truths which are being said here. I think we must mention also Herr Anger. Herr Anger was Raoul Wallenberg's closest friend and co-worker in saving thousands upon thousands of Jews and exposing himself to danger. He was a regular diplomat. He could have just collected his salary and gone to meetings and so on. But no, he, like Raoul, did the same work and to the end of his life pursued to find out the truth about what happened to Raoul. He even refused some diplomatic appointments where he felt that Raoul would be unfairly treated. The thing is that Raoul and support with Pear 
actually managed to slow down the deportation by influencing Admiral Haughty with letters from King Gustav V. This resulted that overall, 100,000 Jews were saved, uh, not only through Raoul and Karl Lutz and others, but also through the slowdown. Lastly, Raoul was the largest landlord in Budapest to Hungarian Jews, organizing medical support, food, education, uh, a medicum of reality. We have to be so grateful to a man like this, and we have to remember him forever and encourage others to follow his example. The importance of Raoul Wallenberg and people like him is to teach us and to teach future generations how to save others, irrespective of their race, religion, sexual orientation, or anything else. And I believe that it is our utmost duty to inform the next generation about Wallenberg's deeds so that we get Wallenberg's of the future. I so agree with you, George, and I think that my grandmother would agree with you as well. Uh, the um, since Raoul disappeared, and we still do not know his the full truth about his fate. Um, the, the, what we can do is to use him as a role model. So my grandmother used to say that Raoul's life should never be in vain, but we can use him as a role model and and teach the example of of a brave person who made a very big difference. Yes, I, I share the views of uh, both George and uh, Cecilia. Raoul Wallenberg uh, is a role model, uh, a role model particularly uh, for young people, uh, a role model for moral courage, which is so essential in our day and in any day. Uh, a person who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront the evil and prevail. Uh, we don't have role models like that anymore, regrettably. And I think Raoul Wallenberg is an inspirational uh, role model, and especially for young people. Uh, that's why in our Malmo pledges in Sweden, Canada undertook to teach in Holocaust education, particularly to young people, about the heroic life and the endearing legacy of Raoul Wallenberg for the younger uh, generation so that they could not only learn but act upon those lessons that Raoul Wallenberg has taught us. I think that is so important because at the Academy we also talk about the small deeds and the big deeds. Raoul obviously did a very big deed and that's not maybe easy for everybody to to take in because it seems like overwhelming and, and, and such an great thing that he did. But what can you do in your everyday life? How can you support a friend who is being bullied? Or how can you react to somebody who's being mistreated in the street? Or if somebody is mean to somebody else in, in the subway or whatever it is, uh, try to act a little bit every day. And that way, I think that we can make the world a better place. And it doesn't take much. It takes a bit of courage. And what we have seen with civil courage is that the more you act, the more you feel good about yourself and the braver you become. So every time you act, you will become a little bit braver and you will maybe do a bigger action and, and, and it, will, it will pay forward. So that is important. I would like to add something to that, if I may. And, and that is, I mean, we totally agree with Cecilia in saying, the worrying trend is that anti-Semitism today is becoming ex accepted mainstream. We have plenty of examples of that. Uh, we have former pr uh, President Trump, who is having lunch with Yi and a prominent um, Holocaust denier at mar a lago We have a president who has sworn to uphold the Constitution and now is sworn to destroy it. I mean, these things are becoming mainline, and, and this is a danger. This is a great danger. 
It reminds me uh, when Dr. Goebbels uh, denigrated the Jews before the Holocaust started to make them inhuman. And, and this is the danger now which we are fighting is that different groups can be denigrated in this way and then be targeted to extreme measures. I think we have to appreciate that anti-Semitism and hate is, is toxic uh, to democracies. It's really an assault on our uh, common uh, humanity. That's why uh, what George said, what Cecilia said is, is so important. The importance of acts of civil courage, as Cecilia said, at a time of the mainstreaming of anti-Semitism, as, as George uh, put it. You know, whenever I think of Raoul Wallenberg, and when I listen to Cecilia and George, I, I'm reminded of what Maimonides, the sage Maimonides, once said, that we should each see the world as uh, divided into half evil and half good. And one good deed by any one of us on any given day transfers the ledger from evil to good. So any one of us with that kind of civil courage uh, can transfer uh, the ledger, and I think young people here can do a great deal in changing the nature of the universe from evil to good. And also the importance of of um, making the bystanders not be bystanders anymore, but to take a small step for um, injustice or whatever it is, because if the bystanders don't say anything, then we allow it to become mainstream. We allow it to become the norm, nor, normal actions. But so I think that uh, as soon as we can encourage the bystanders to actually act and to actually stand up or say something, then we have come a far, we come a far way. Raoul Ra Wallenberg uh, acted amidst an international community of bystanders and demonstrated civil courage amongst that bystander community. For young people, there could not be a more heroic example of the role that they can play uh, in our universe. I fully agree, I'm sorry, I fully agree with Irvin and Cecilia, and I think that this is why our task is to educate the next generation, to educate them uh, to discern between fake media and the truth and to encourage them to do good deeds, whether that's on a smaller scale, which is very important also, or to join an association on a larger scale, but leave it up to them uh, to contribute in a positive sense. And that is so important to, to feel your passion, because if you, if you are really involved in the climate change, then engage in that. If you're really involved in anti-Semitism or against anti-Semitism, engage in that. Whatever it is that you feel passionate about, as soon as you engage, you will change the world. In, in a... But I think that also we have to remember that, that Raoul's deeds, of course, for the people that he saved, um, they, they were remembered, is important to them and a hero for them uh, forever. But his deeds did not become famous or um, he didn't get appreciated from his government or other other government uh, until a lot later. So I think that this small action that you do maybe doesn't show today that you made a difference, but it will show in six months or in five years that you actually made a difference. You can change a person's life by, you know, being kind and giving a smile and uh, just help somebody else at a time of need. Yeah, these small acts of, of kindness, you know, I'm reminded also when Raoul Wallenberg was asked why he did what he did, he, he said in a, in a very humble, but when one thinks about it, you know, so determinative fashion, he said, for me, there was no other choice. And I think we should look at things that when we see things that need to be changed, uh, we can be that agent of change. And young people, whether it be with regard to the environment or whether it be with regard to uh, taking care of the elderly, whatever the issue is, they should look upon it as something that they could make 
a difference. They can be the change agent that they want to be. Yes, I think that's very important. And I think that also Cecilia said, just a good morning smile or opening the door. I mean, these are all, you know, little tasks, but I Maimonides mean, said that one good deed saving one life can change the world. We should remember that. Well, that, that was exceptional. Um, and uh, I wish that could be seen by every young person in Canada. And I will only take one point of disagreement with my friend, Erwin Kotler. I think there were three fantastic role models in that video. And I'm so glad it's, it's, it's been recorded and it can be shared with an important message about civil and moral courage. Our next um, speaker I would like to introduce now um, she is Eva Gaugerard, and she's a teacher of human rights at Hersby High School in Sweden. She is also the project coordinator at the Raoul Wallenberg Academy for the International Q Project and the Young Courage Award. Eva, I want to thank you for joining us from Stockholm, and let's begin by asking you, how is the weather there? I see it's very dark where you are. Yeah, it, it is dark but, and it's <laughs> raining as well. Uh, but they say that it's getting brighter and brighter, right? Because we're in January, but yeah, uh, a bit tough with the weather right now and with the light so that you could see me. But <laughs> yes, uh, I just also want to add that I'm a teacher in Swedish and French. And then I have human rights at special, uh, special work at my high school. So Swedish and French are both my subjects. And uh, I was uh, saying that it gets brighter day by day. And sadly, uh, this is not always the case now for human rights. And one might argue that the more we learn, uh, the better it would be. But in fact, uh, that is not always the case. In France, recent studies show that the young people are not as connected to democracy as before. In Spain and Sweden, student health talk to me about a COVID generation where they see that the conflicts between students in high school look more like conflicts usually taking place in younger ages. Why? Because the social networking has not been the same during COVID and they missed out. Anti-Semitism is on the rise as we know in social media and in Sweden, a large study from Gothenburg University about gender equality and sexism in Europe shows that it is not the older generation, but young men who have the most difficulty in accepting advances in women's rights. So what way can we do in our schools uh, in the world to work with these matters? As when working with the Holocaust and the, for example, the famous uh, pyramid of the genocide on top and the biased attitudes in the bottom, it is the same, I think, with human rights. They need of course, our students to know the fact, but they also need the know how and the know why to be able to connect and feel empathy in our daily lives. That way, working with human rights can be both small things and big things, like Cecilia just said, and I will talk a bit about our work. My mission as teacher with merits in my school, Hashby in Sweden, is human rights and value-based work. Come rain, come shine. I continue my mission to work with it. And for five years now, I have also had a mission with the Swedish Institute and the foreign missions that we have in the world. And that is to travel around to help other countries that would like to take part in the projects and help them with the work with human rights. And the projects are from the Ralph Wallenberg Academy together with the Swedish Institute, the CUBE, Every Person Can Make a Difference that works with human rights and Young Courage Award a new international prize given to young change makers that need to meet other change makers as role models. So Sweden exports these two with us at the Academy to other countries. And I'm proud of that because that means that my government in Sweden and the Swedish Institute care about this. And what I, from what I've read about your great country, Canada, you seem to be very advanced when it comes to issues regarding these matters. Uh, so now I will try and broaden the perspective not only to anti-Semitism, but human rights in general, as that is my mission in my school and as a teacher and abroad. Uh, I'm so sorry that I have to tell you that I'm not a history teacher. It was one of my worst subjects in school, unfortunately. 
with my two children when I ask them questions before their exams, they ask me not to sound as enthusiastic, but for me, a lot of what I read is new. History for me was just a blur in high school. And the only thing from history lessons that I really got interested in was World War II. I was shocked, appalled, and I actually bought this book, um, A World at War by Mark Arnold Forster. And when my teachers read my answers in the exam, he didn't encourage me because they were, of course, long, intricate, perhaps. Uh, he just wrote to me, too much, Eva. I try and never say that to my students when they start to dig in. In both my subjects, Swedish and French, I have discovered that it is of utmost importance to work with issues that they care about. It needs to be hands-on and creative, I think. An argumentative essay about something they want to change in Sweden, why not send the letters to the politicians so that they can see and then get answers when they write poems in French inspired by Eluard and his fantastic poem, Liberté after the Second World War. Why not let them write about what freedom is for them now in their lives and then post it all on the walls of the school. To work with the news is of course also an amazing way to work with human rights and this autumn full with interesting things. The one love story from the World Championships of Football, Germany posting the picture where the entire team holds the hand like this over their mouths. The situation of the migrant workers, a war next to us, elections. The students do want to talk about this and they do care. Sometimes my colleagues stress out and they say, you do a great work, Eva. I understand, but right now I don't have time to work with human rights. I often find myself giving them one answer in my head. Are you sure you have the time not to work with human rights? Look around you. But I don't say that, so I smile and I give them plenty of material that I gather when I travel in the world and give them the explicit information. It is in the school law to work in all subjects in school with the themes democracy against discrimination for human rights and moral courage and equality of all. It is the law. Is it easy? No, but it's fascinating and I learn a lot. And the key for my school has been to be creative, hands-on and systematic in the work. A human rights week every year. I'm aware of the fact that this, like Black History Month or other events, sometimes people say, but, but what about the other months? There's a risk we forget it. For me, they coexist. The first year it was small, the second it grew bigger, and now it often includes speakers, performances by students, exhibitions, and work between groups. We collaborate with Amnesty and other organizations and invite politicians to come to the school. So now both teachers and students come up to me and say, Eva, I have an idea for the Human Rights Week. What if we could, and I always say, perfect, tell me if you need any help. But it takes time and why does it do so? I think it's because the topics are really difficult. We need to have formation and know more about the topics and days like today are of utmost importance. We need to be ahead of things and be informed, but value-based topics as the ones often quoted in the school law do not always come first. I think they need to be there together with digitalization and other things always. My school has been in the CUBE project with the Ralph Wallenberg Academy five times. 30 CUBEs are put in schools in Sweden and now also in international schools in the world, which I'm really grateful for. They each get an article from the United Nations, article of a list of 30 rights. This one, the first year we had it was the right to freedom. The first year, I will tell you what happened. We asked the teachers in history and they said, okay, let's invite a person that survived the Holocaust and can tell the story. Another group of teachers said, let's invite Martin Shibi to talk about freedom of the press. He was in prison in Ethiopia for more than a year as perhaps you know of. The Swedish teachers said, yes, we are gonna have an essay about this theme. And some people also did that their students had to write down what freedom was for them right now in the entire school. The art teacher, of course, gave also the students this thing to do. And they said, we're gonna do paintings and t-shirts. 
what do you want to do with the t-shirts then we said we want to have a fashion show but with the principal and teachers as on being on the fashion walk they said yes even our principal liked it what is a symbol for you we asked to talk about freedom and they said as you could see on this photo shoes so they said we want to do a collective shoes 700 pair of shoes came in on one day and they were all sent to a refugee camp in, uh, in Africa, in Sudan. Hands-on human rights. Now we have a collect every year. This year, of course, Ukraine with Christmas gift to an orphanage. And when the students write down messages to the children, they ask us, but what can I write to a person I don't know? Can I write, have a great day or Perhaps they don't have a great there over there right now. We don't know. Can you write something else instead? They say, perhaps we think about you. Empathy, handsome. And then show them the pictures of the things arriving over there that they will remember. And finally, the students in music wrote songs about freedom and the cheerleaders danced. Yes, of course, it is both an act of freedom and an article, the right to culture and science in the list. So we try and create a year wheel um, every year. And what to do with, for example, Valentine's Day, hearts all over the school, perhaps. Uh, do we have a time for these things? The other ones say, I say, do we have time not to? It will perhaps help a person that comes to school to have the test that day. Information about how many Jews that died in the Holocaust. Of course, we need to say that, but also let them see the names of some of them outside of the synagogue in Stockholm. They get all silence and ask themselves, who was that person really? They do care. A story about Raoul saving many at a pier in Budapest then, where they were normally attached three by three to save bullets before they were killed. Why not take them to a pier and tell the story? Instead of saying role models are important, act like one and invite old students that make a difference today in human rights or other. A person that inspires me a lot is Eleanor Roosevelt. She didn't only take part in the project of uh, writing down the 30 articles. You can see her here with the list, but she really tried to live them. In Alabama, she was with Franklin to listen to his speech and the organizers told her to sit down with the white persons, not the people of color. Eleanor did an amazing thing. He, she took a chair like this, took it out and sat down between both groups and showed them that she was serious about human rights. For us in school, I think we need to be both serious, creative and hands-on to let the work against anti-Semitism and for human rights be in focus. Like a bit like going to the gym, one time wouldn't be enough. It needs to be systematic to create change. We need to listen to the students' ideas more too, I think. Make sure a lasting impact is instilled in the generations to come, fostering a world without genocide, was a the theme on the concept note sent to me before this event. Could we also add that work against discrimination with an inner compass that care about the people around them, that have knowledge about human rights, but also have know-how, know how about them to dare to stand up and make a difference in different ways with hearts and guts and know how not to act today and in the future. Thank you. Eva, thank you so much. I, I haven't met you before, but I already know you must be a deeply cherished teacher uh, in Sweden. That was incredible. And I'm happy to hear if I understood correctly that you do do international consulting because the world needs a lot more teachers like you. You're, you're incredible. Thank you so much for being here with us today. That was, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, I now have the pleasure of introducing to you Marilyn Sinclair, who is the founder of Liberation 75, the world's largest event to commemorate the 75th anniversary of liberation from the Holocaust. Liberation 75's mission is to collaborate and innovate to bring the highest quality Holocaust education to Canadian teachers and students. In partnership with Holocaust organizations from around the world, since 2020, Liberation 75 has provided educational experiences to more than 750,000 Canadian students and teachers. Liberation 75 was recently granted an award of $140,000 from the Ontario government 
to provide Holocaust anti-Semitism education resources for educators and students. So Marilyn, over to you. Thank you so much, Linda. And Eva, I love that chair. That is so fantastic. I love the story. So my name is Marilyn Sinclair. I'm the child of a Hungarian Holocaust survivor whose family was murdered in Auschwitz. And I wanna tell you a story about something that happened to me just two weeks ago. I received a phone call from a teacher in, the, in Northern Ontario who was quite upset. And this was a story she told. She was looking out the window of her classroom after a fresh snowfall and the students, largely grade six students were in the playground playing and they started with their boots to carve out something in the snow. And she thought, I really hope they're not doing what I think they're doing. And what they did was they carved a giant swastika in the snow um, uh, across the field. And then they circled the snow swastika and they proceeded to give the Nazi salute to the snow. She was very upset. She said, what do I do in a situation like that? Now, I'd like to say that this is an uncommon story. Unfortunately, it's not. We're finding more and more of the acts of anti-Semitism that are happening in the schools are happening in this grade six to eight age group. And while it might be tempting to say these kids are learning about you know, how to be neo-Nazis while eating mashed potatoes with their families. I think we all can agree that that's probably not what is happening. But what is happening is that these kids are on gaming sites and on social media, and they're learning about these symbols and how to be provocative with them without really understanding what they mean and how hurtful they are. In 2021, Liberation 75 released the reports of a survey that showed that Canadian students um, had much less awareness of the Holocaust than we would have liked. In fact, one in three thought that the Holocaust was either exaggerated, fabricated, or they weren't sure what to think about it. The other piece of sort of bad news in that that didn't get as much reporting in the press was that 42% of students said they had unequivocally witnessed an anti-Semitic event in their schools. So 42%, when you think that there are 400,000 Jews in Canada, these kids across Canada, most of them who've never met a Jewish person, witnessed something that they knew and identified as an anti-Semitic event. Now, the good news from our survey, if there was any good news, was that 92% of the students wanted to learn more about the Holocaust. So that was good news. And we took all of these survey results to the Minister of Education, plus the results from the schools and the school boards showing the number of anti-Semitic events and when they were occurring. And because of this, Ontario's Education Minister, the Honourable Stephen Lecce, announced on November 9th, mandated Holocaust education in grade six starting this coming September. So we were thrilled, of course, and we, we certainly hope other provinces will follow. We've recently heard that Northwest Territories is already committed to following this. But my other side of my brain said, what happens when these teachers tell the parents about this mandated Holocaust education, is the left shoe gonna drop? Are the parents going to worry that their kids are gonna be learning about gas chambers and, 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 and pits filled with bodies and crematorias? And, and that was a, a really important point for me to try and get across to the media when we were talking to them was that don't worry because how we teach Holocaust education for grade sixes is entirely different than how we would teach it in high school. So I'll give you an example about how we're teaching Holocaust education to these younger grades. So Liberation 75 is thrilled to be premiering the Williston Project in Canada for the very first time in actually less than two weeks. So if we could please run the short little film. It's an unforgettable tale of resilience, survival, and hope. Lisa didn't care about any rules. The Children of Willesden Lane is the true story of Lisa Yura, a teenage Jewish refugee who escaped the Holocaust, held on to her dreams, and inspired a generation of her contemporaries. No 
including her daughter, celebrated concert pianist Mona Golubek, who has shared Lisa's story with more than a million students around the world. Now, through the Williston Reads program, you can inspire students of all ages to grapple with tough topics like bigotry and hatred and empower them to be resilient and hold on to their own dreams. Register and have your students join thousands of their peers for the Williston Reads program. Thank you. We are so thrilled to be premiering this program, which we believe is the largest Holocaust education program in the world. And it really speaks to the power of collaboration because this program that's done in collaboration with the Jewish Heritage Committee of the Toronto District School Board, the USC Shoah Foundation and Echoes and Reflections shows that through collaboration, we can teach our kids messages like heroism and resilience and hope and how to stand up for each other and not be bystanders, but be upstanders. So these are such important messages that can be taught to grade six students and really at any age. So, so far with the Williston Project, we have distributed more than 10,000 books to students across Ontario. We have 4,000 students attending four live performances at the Meridian Arts Centre in Toronto. We filled every seat in under 48 hours. More than 20,000 have already signed up for the live stream performance on February 1st at 10 a.m. And more than 40 educational resources have been created for teachers to be able to use with their students in French and English. And if anybody who's watching today wants to register, please go to liberation75.org to do that. And of course, all the resources that Liberation 75 creates are always free to the teachers and the students. And for teachers who are also wondering, how are they going to get access to the resources they need to be able to teach, particularly in grade six? We have developed an educational toolkit, which we are continuing to build out, that features the resources of all the best practice Holocaust organizations from around the world who have really honed in on particular ages and grades to be able to teach the Holocaust. And of course, stay tuned for many exciting initiatives, always in collaboration with others as we continue to develop them. This is truly our time to make a difference. The needs are there. The students want the education. The teachers want to teach it. The world needs this type of education. And we hope everyone's really on board to collaborate, to bring this education and to bring mandated Holocaust education to every province across Canada. Thank you. And back to you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And thank you for being such a tireless champion of promoting the importance of Holocaust education. You do so much great work. Thank you. Next, um, I'm going to introduce to you Dara Solomon of UJA Federation of Greater Toronto. Dara will present on the plans for the new Toronto Holocaust Museum, which will be opening in the spring of 2023. The new museum will inspire visitors to think deeply about the Holocaust and make connections between history, world events, and contemporary Canadian life through, layered, through a layered and technology-rich experience. Over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here to share with you our plans for the Toronto Holocaust Museum opening um, this June, actually, um, June 8th. So stay tuned um, for the exciting news um, as, it, as it rolls out in the community. So I'm just going to turn my slides on. Just give me one second. Nita, whoops, one second. Okay, sorry, start at the beginning. So the Holocaust Museum is opening this spring, as I said, and it really is a place to honor and commemorate the life of our survivor community who um, have dedicated so much time um, to sharing their stories. So we're going to share their stories long after they're gone through technology. Um, we wanna share both 
the what happened to them before their before the war, during the Holocaust, and then their lives in Canada and how they settled and rebuilt here. Um, we also know that Holocaust education, as Marilyn talked about, is an important tool in our community's efforts to fight contemporary anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. So we will make sure that the Holocaust is a springboard for discussions around countering anti-Semitism and hate. We want to be a convening space for all the different organizations working in the field around Holocaust education, and we really become this hub um, for community Holocaust education for the GTA and beyond. So I'm just going to walk you through some renderings so you get a sense of the immersive environment that we've created. So the first area is the mezzanine, where you'll be surrounded by images of pre-war Jewish life, because we know students have to understand what was lost and not just dump them into the narrative of the Holocaust, because for many of the students that come, we recognize that they may not know any Jews. And so we want to introduce them to the richness of Jewish life before the war. And we'll do that straight right at the beginning. They then go into a theater experience. And we know that students are going to come in with many different knowledge levels. We are anticipating grade six students now. And so we've created different kinds of experiences depending on the grade level. So a few different film experiences, a film that continues that narrative from the mezzanine about pre-war Jewish life, um, a, something that we're calling Basics of the Holocaust, which is a very introductory level for younger students, and then a more complex film, which really makes the connection, lays the foundation for how the Holocaust happened and really sets up the visitor for the experience in the museum. So the museum is built around four main galleries. The first one is the 1930s. What happened to the Jews during this time when Hitler um, slowly came to power and the Nazis started eroding the democracy of the fragile democracy of Germany? We have interactives right from the beginning. So in addition to the texts and graphics and artifacts, there's also timelines and interactive maps on the right hand side of my screen, you'll see a testimony station. And this is really where you'll begin to hear from the voice of a survivor. And there's 11 of these large scale testimony stations throughout the experience where students will interact with content, be able to lead their learning, inquiry based learning with being able to ask questions on different subject matters. The next gallery is um, the Atrocities Gallery, where you start to learn about the ghettoization, this isolation of the Jewish community, the different modes of murder that made up this genocide. So we have um, concentration camps and the forced um, death marches and, and the very complicated, difficult subject to study, but we've done it in a very sensitively sensitive way. Again, the survivor voice leading the experience. So it really becomes... Um, an opportunity for students to hear firsthand from a survivor so that these the voices belong to people and they understand that this was done to a group of people, to individuals who may you know, have had um, a, a life that might be similar to their life in some way. So they really make these very in, um, important connections with survivors. Um, after a tr the um, you learn about the atrocities of the Holocaust, you learn about liberation. And this was a time when Holocaust, those who survived the Holocaust tried to find family members, tried to return back to their homes and realize that there was nothing there. And they started to try to figure out where they would go. They lived in displaced person camp, persons camps. And we talk about life in those camps where they sort of stayed for sometimes many years until they figured out which countries would, would take them. Um, again, you hear firsthand from survivors. Um, I also want to point out that throughout the experience, we tie it back to Canada because it's so important that the students are not learning this history in a vacuum and they start to understand what was happening in Canada at the time that this world war was going on. How did how did Canada join militarily, but also how is it reported in the newspapers, in the mainstream press, in the Jewish press? How were other groups being treated during this time here in Canada? How were the Jews treated? Anti-Semitism wasn't unique to Nazi Germany. There was anti-Semitism here locally. And so we discussed that as well. And it's a, an important thread that runs throughout the museum. 
The final gallery is Life in Canada and Rebuilding. And in this gallery, we really celebrate the efforts of the Holocaust survivors who made Canada their home. They had challenges, like all different immigrant groups that arrived here. Um, some of these challenges continued throughout their lives. Some had many successful and fruitful lives after they established themselves in Canada. Again, the kiosks you hear directly from a survivor. We have the maps and in this gallery, because we know our students have come from, they themselves have come from places of war and tragedy. We on the maps continue the story of immigration to Canada, starting with the survivors in the post-war period and we have other groups that come. So the students who visit this museum see themselves in this continuum of immigration to Canada. And we talk about how Canada became a multicultural place, even though it wasn't initially, and it was difficult for survivors to get here. And they didn't start coming until the late 40s and early 50s. And we, we, we sort of paint that picture, that sort of complicated picture around immigration um, for, for visitors while celebrating the survivors while examining the legacy of the Holocaust that um, lives in our community and is also part of the fabric of Canadian society. In addition to the four galleries, there's a beautiful memorial space that has a landscape theme. And this landscape is engraved with the names of victims of the Holocaust. And these names came from um, a an existing memorial in our pre in our older space um, and we've transferred those names over and it's a beautiful peaceful space the names become illuminated as you move towards the walls to read them so in addition to the films the testimony kiosks the interactive maps that i mentioned there's also an interactive interactive tablet experience that we've created. And this allows us to curate the content specifically for the student visitor. They will each get a tablet and they will follow um, one of the tours pre-selected by their um, teacher. And we're creating these tours um, based on um, different um, learning goals that we have. You might be able to follow one survivor's story throughout we have one on contemporary anti-Semitism and hate. So really connecting those dots from the history to the present. We have an experts tour, which is more like your traditional audio guide that you have in, um, in a museum. And we are developing one that will be specifically for the younger learners um, with that um, addition of grade six Holocaust learning. The final experience is in a learning lab where we will customize workshops based on the current moment. So for example, if we wanted to do something very specific around the Holocaust and the war in Ukraine, we'll be able to do that in the space, take current events and connect the history to the present because we know that teaching the history of the Holocaust is important and it is also a wonderful tool in making those connections about what happens when we don't protect our civil society. So these tours will be customized, they'll be current and of the moment, and will really ensure that Holocaust education is relevant for today's students. We have a wonderful team that are researching online hate, and we know that that's an issue, as Marilyn mentioned, it's the world online where students are being informed of all this um, anti-Semitism and hate. And so we will create workshops that are specifically designed to combat, to combat that. Um, and they'll stay fresh and contemporary because we'll be making sure that they're updated depending on what's going on in the world around us. So I think that I'll stop sharing my screen and return it to Linda. Thank you so much for having me here today. Dara, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that presentation. And I just want to say, and I, you and I have worked together now for many years, uh, but it is a huge accomplishment to have a museum of such international caliber uh, that's going to be located in Toronto, a city that took in a disproportionate number of survivors. Um, and I know that the person most responsible for this project is you, and our community owes you a great deal for this. So thank you so much, and thanks for being thank here you, today. Linda. Thank you, Thank you. Um, next, we are going to have another video segment. We are going to hear from Ambassador Ann Burns from the Swedish Foreign Service, where she serves as chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA. 
during the Swedish presidency, uh, which started um, on the 1st of March, 2022, and will last until the 28th of February of this year. The IRA unites governments and experts in strengthening, advancing, and promoting Holocaust education, remembrance, and research. It was founded by former Swedish Prime Minister Joran Passen in 1998, and it now includes 35 member countries from around the world, including, of course, Canada. So now we'll hear from the ambassador. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is an honor to address you in my capacity as chair of the IRA. And on this particular day, when we gather to commemorate and pay tribute to Ralph Wallenberg, the C Swedish diplomat and businessman who saved thousands of Jews in Nazi-occupied Hungary in the face of great danger to himself. All of the world are streets, monuments, and public institutions dedicated to Wallenberg, as well as prizes and training programs brought up to promote and recognize achievements in his spirit. Wallenberg has also been awarded his honorary citizenship in several countries, including Canada, and was in 1963 recognized as one of the righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Israel. Alongside the many accounts by eyewitnesses, obvious inspiring deeds and courage, the access to archives has allowed scholars to provide an in-depth understanding of not only what Wallenberg achieved to, to do, but also how and why. And only last August, the Ralph Wallenberg Academy in Sweden launched a digital museum where the first exhibition allows you to walk through Wallenberg's hometown, Stockholm, in his footsteps. In spite of all these efforts to piece together more and more parts of Wallenberg's life, there are still question marks surrounding his fate following his arrest by Soviet forces in Budapest on this very day. 78 years ago, in 1945. The access to various archives would help in the efforts to understand exactly what happened to him in captivity. And this is an aspect and example that I have stressed when I, as chair of the IRA, had participated in the launch and the promotion of a set of new IRA guidelines focused on identifying relevant documentation for Holocaust research, education, and remembrance, aimed at assisting archives and other entities in assessing their collections and increasing access to them. The development and launch of these guidelines form part of the IRA's ongoing collective work on its two current priorities, to safeguard the record of the Holocaust and to counter distortion of the Holocaust. Priorities that couldn't be more relevant in a time where more and more survivors and eyewitnesses leave us and Holocaust denial, distortion and disinformation appear in all kinds of contexts. The aim of our presidency has, from day one, been to enhance the collective impact of the IRA by promoting that priorities and pledges are turned into practice and positive change. A key tool has been to encourage the implementation of the commitments made at the MAMA International Forum held in October 2021. The MAMA Forum approach meant that all participating leaders were asked to go from words to deeds and to make concrete pledges in the areas of Holocaust remembrance and education and combating anti-Semitism, anti-Gypsyism and racism in all spheres of life, including on social media. The result was rather astounding. 60 delegations made around 150 pledges, covering all the areas of the forum and thereby more or less the whole mandate of the IRA. We will soon present a comprehensive report about the first year of implementation. We have also paid extra attention to the genocide of the Roma and to anti-Gypsyism by holding an international conference, by promoting resources dedicated to the issues, and by highlighting the discriminatory treatment of Roma fleeing Ukraine. 
the motto of the Swedish Presidency of the IRA is Together for Impact, promoting Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism and anti-Gypsyism through cooperation and dialogue. And after nearly completing our presidency, we remain convinced that cooperation built on shared values is the only way forward and that the IRA is more important than ever. And I would say not only as an in organization for international action, but also as a pr platform for highlighting and supporting ind individual action. And here Ralph Wallenberg is and will forever remain a role model for the civil courage that we all need to develop, promote and support in order to stand up against evil and defend human rights. So let us always remember and learn from the legacy of Ralph Wallenberg in our strive for a better world for all. Thank you. We are now at the last segment of today's program. Professor Emeritus Yvonne Singer will provide some closing remarks. Professor Singer is an artist and educator living in Toronto. Her art investigates the intersection of personal and political histories. She was born in Budapest in, on November 4th, 1944. And in 1979, a Toronto Star article about Raoul Wallenberg, in that article, she discovered that Raoul Wallenberg was her godfather. It was a revelation that profoundly influenced her life and her work. Professor. Thank you. The text I am about to read is excerpted from a 1993 exhibition of mine called In Memoriam, Forgetting and Remembering Fragments of History. It was conceived in response to speculations about Raoul Wallenberg, uh, whereabouts in survival, as well as an exploration of my sur surprising relationship to Wallenberg as my godfather. Here is the text. Listen carefully. This is important. Look at me. Watch me. Swedish diplomat saves 100,000 Jews in Budapest. Raoul Wallenberg, skiing of a wealthy family and a known Jew, at great personal risk, single-handedly saved more Jews than whole governments. This angel of rescue was kidnapped by the Red Army and never seen again outside a Soviet prison. Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, I can't see you. Wallenberg didn't look like a hero. He was not a square jaw type. His slightly balding head made him look too young and sensitive for the nightmarish job ahead. Classmates recall him as warm and friendly, not snobbish. He was not fearless by nature. I am telling you a story which I cannot tell. I have been sworn to secrecy. We listen, we hear, we speak. We speak, we hear, we listen, we listen. We hear, we speak. Some believe it impossible to survive Soviet prison for so many years. Others believe that a man like Wallenberg might. Didn't look like a hero. Overly prominent nose. Weak chin. Thinning hair. Too soft. Too cerebral. I was trying to forget. No, I mean, I was trying to remember. And in July 1944, at the age of 32, the skin of an aristocratic family of Swedish Lutherans, bankers, industrialists, he had a consuming sense of duty. He was a driven man. He was a great actor and could imitate brilliantly. Mystery surrounds the fate of the Swede who saved the Jews. Sorry, I, I 
I forgot. Sorry, I can't remember. And in the privacy of empty rooms, I and you listen carefully. This is important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singer, for giving us such an eloquent closing to our program. Uh, at this time, I would like to thank all of our outstanding speakers, and I would like to thank all of you who have joined the program by Zoom. I want to thank the ambassador and the embassy for all that they do to foster Holocaust remembrance and education. This recording um, will be, there was a recording of today's program, and it will be sent to all those who registered. And with that, let me say thank you and goodbye.